Hello, and welcome to Women in Wealth. I'm Liz Shaybaker, CEO of Versant Capital Management, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Over the last few decades, women have come into increasing economic power. There are a number of demographic shifts that underscore this trend and speak to its implications. When it comes to investing, women in wealth might be thought of as a changing landscape. In this webinar, we will highlight some of the common financial hurdles women face and how you can work to overcome them. I'd like to introduce you to Kane Kraus, Vice President and Head of Client Communities at Dimensional Fund Advisors, headquartered in Austin, Texas. Dimensional is a strategic partner with us. In addition to being one of our investment managers, they also work very closely with us to offer a robust client experience. Kane works with wealth management firms like Versant to help develop investment solutions, address practice management needs, and to work through strategic business initiatives. Kane also oversees more than 80 groups and forums, including women in wealth and sustainable investing where she strategizes on how financial advisory firms can make their processes more accessible to women. Kane is a certified financial analyst and holds an MBA from UCLA and a bachelor's degree in aeronautical and astronautical engineering from Purdue. Kane and I are excited to discuss with you today on how and why more women are interested in getting a better understanding of their full financial picture. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to address. Please note that all webinar attendees are muted. Please use the chat function on the right to ask questions or comments. The chats are private and are being managed by our moderator, Anne, who's working behind the scenes. Your questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to your question, a Versant advisor will reach out to you directly to answer your question. If you have any connection issues while watching this webinar, please press the red reconnect button on the top of your screen. Thank you and welcome Kane. Liz, thank you so much. And thank you for that lovely introduction. I am super excited to be here talking about one of my favorite subjects, women in wealth. Uh, as Liz spoke, she spoke a little bit about dimensional fund advisors. And as she noted, we are an investment management firm. We manage mutual funds. Versant utilizes our strategies to help their clients achieve their financial goals. Our approach is based in science. And as Liz alluded to, we work with a lot of financial advisors across the country. I wanted to just tell you a little bit about the women in wealth community at Dimensional, just to give you a sense of what I sometimes call our street cred in this. Um, it was about five years ago that we started this women's and women in wealth initiative to really explore the ideas of women in wealth management. Uh, and if there was something that Dimensional could contribute to that conversation, like Liz, there are a number of advisors that specialize in serving women and understanding women's unique needs. Some advisors became advisors because they wanted to help other women. So I had heard I've been at Dimensional for 13 years and actually 13 years tomorrow is my anniversary. But I had for years at Dimensional heard um, about how serving women is different. And I had started to see that advisors were having niches that were developed around certain women's segments. So we wanted to see if there was something that we could contribute to that conversation. Uh, Dimensional, one thing that we're really good at is, because we work with so many advisors, is we really understand the wealth management landscape. And women in wealth, was one of these things that, as Liz alluded to, is a changing landscape. So my goal in all of this is to help give you some perspective on some of the things that we see. 
And I hope it will inspire you to think about your own situation, whether you're a woman or a man. I know we have some men in the audience today. And as well as, but to think about your own situation as well as the women who are important to you in your life, whether it's your mothers, your sisters, your wives, your daughters, your friends, your colleagues. So again, we, you know, my goal in all of this, and you'll probably hear me say this a couple times, is to inspire you, to help you think about these things, give you some interesting things to that maybe hadn't crossed your mind before. And to start that, we have a couple polls to get us started. So Liz, you're going to run uh, the polls. And as much as we are in the virtual environment, we'd like to make this as interactive. So Liz already talked about submitting questions. We will stop and pause for questions along the way. But we have a few polls to get you thinking. So are we ready for the first poll, Liz? I am. Okay, go ahead and launch it and I'll talk everybody through it. Can you see it? I there cannot. We go. Okay, oh, you know what? I had some answers. Okay, so here we go. So people can see it. So the first poll question that we have for all of you is what is the average age of widowhood? Said another way, what is the average age that a woman becomes a widow? So we see the answers coming in. We'll give you another second to just add your answers. I think this is a particularly provocative question. Okay, so we're gonna end the poll. And can we share the result? Um, did you hit something, King? <laughs> I did. You know what, can we, can we, Okay, the, the wonderfulness of doing a live virtual event. I'll tell you what, can everybody, I didn't hit published, I hit ended. Can we, let's see if we can start that poll again. All right. You don't okay. touch anything. I'm not touching anything. Okay, your answer, if you wanted to change your answer, this is a good time to change your answer. It's a good thing we didn't give away the answer. Okay. All right, I think we're good. Everybody thought about it, and we have a decided answer, Liz. Go ahead and publish it. All right. Okay, so what most of you voted for, 54%, they chose 66. Now, the answer to that is 59. That is a census number. And I think if we were here all together, and we are here all together, but if we were in one room, and usually when I give this talk, we are in one room, I interact with people, and I get a chance to say, does that number surprise you? Liz, does that number surprise you, 59, as being the average age that somebody becomes a widow? You know what? I've been doing this for many years now, and in the beginning, I would have said, absolutely, that seems very young. But in the last uh, probably five years, I've had several um, clients come to me um, in their early to mid-50s and had just yeah. buried their husbands. Yes. So it does not surprise me anymore. Yeah, I was uh, at a client event in an event like this, a live one, in the fall of last year in Seattle. And I remember asking that. And usually we make these questions a multiple choice, or I'll just throw it out. Usually people think that, that the average happens in the 60s or even 70s. And I, so I think that this is a particularly provocative, thought-provoking question, that 59 is that age. Um, and I remember one of the women in that particular live event said, well, that was how old I was when I lost my husband. And so, again, we, we're starting to put a couple provocative uh, polls up here just to get you thinking about women and wealth. So let's run the second poll, Liz. And the second poll that we have, as she pulls it up, is what percentage of businesses are owned by women? So again, this is Amer U.S. businesses. So when we say owned by women, what do you think the percentage of that of women-owned businesses is in the country is uh, today? So we see the answers coming in. Okay, Liz, I think I'm gonna go ahead. I think we've got a good amount of people answering the question. Why don't you go ahead and publish the results? All right, so interestingly, we see A being the most popular answer at 38%, and we also see C coming up 
closely behind? The, the answer is C, 45%. Now, I should have clarified that a little bit, and maybe I should have said what we were looking at is the majority owned. So it could be a sole provider or it could be majority owned. So there could be some male ownerships in this as well. But what I think this starts to frame up is some interesting statistics as far as women and wealth and some and economic power. I like to start off with these two poll questions because it kind of gets to a couple issues, I think, in our brains. Widowhood is such an emotional issue. And then we're looking at women owned businesses. And it's maybe not such a, it's, it's kind of an empowering statistic that 45% of businesses are owned by women or, or majority owned by women. And with that, now that I've got you thinking, hopefully I've got you thinking, I'm going to actually start uh, the presentation for today. So let me go to the slides. And I'm going to actually start off with a few statistics. So there's our cover slide. And the first couple statistics that I want to spotlight are what I think are some interesting demographic shifts that are that are happening that I think underscore the increasing economic uh, economic power of women today. If we look at education, women today are pursuing more undergraduate degrees, 56 percent than ever before. And that number is higher than men. Graduate degrees are even higher than this 56 percent at 60 percent. If we look at labor force statistics, interestingly, women make up 47% of the workforce. And the rapid rise of women in the labor market was actually a major shift in the 20th century. What we saw was that women in the labor force, the participation increased dramatically from 1960 through 1980. And then it leveled off some in the 90s. It's been pretty consistent where 55 to 60% of women work. And, uh, and this also ties into the women pursuing higher levels of education. Now, we just did the poll question about women-owned businesses, but this is another interesting statistic that we've been looking at. As of 2018, there were 12.3 million women-owned businesses in the U.S. Now, comparatively, if we looked back into 1972, there were 402,000 women-owned businesses a much smaller percentage. It was about 5% of all firms at that time. And we also saw that the, the increase in those numbers. So from 2007 to 2018, which was when this stat came out, um, we saw that number increase by about 58%, where businesses overall increased by about 12%. So I wanted to start with these stats, again, because I think it speaks to some interesting demographic shifts that, again, underscore the increasing economic power of women. Now, this next slide also speaks to demographic. Uh, demographics are interesting. This is a quote by an American businessman named Howard Marks. He owns a firm called Oak Tree Capital. It's an investment company. And he is known for writing memos. This quote came from a memo titled Getting Lucky. You can go look it up on the internet. And he wrote this memo after Malcolm Gladwell wrote his book, Outliers. Howard, uh, what I love about this is the memo was really citing these ideas of random luck that happened in his life. And he specifically cites in the memo, the longer version of the memo, demographic luck that contributed to his success. Now this quote talks about getting a good free education in the New York City public schools. But he also specifically talked about how he benefited from the presence of smart women teachers to whom corporate careers weren't available. He had great teachers growing up and many women would have been attorneys or executives or entrepreneurs had it been a few decades later. So I think that all of us right now are in a really interesting time in history to have witnessed these dramatic demographic shifts as it relates to women. A couple other things I want to spotlight. 
What we also see in the recent studies is that women are largely control money, controlling money and how it's spent in the household. The majority of women today manage the family budget. So if we think about the family budget, these are some pretty big economic decisions. We're thinking about things like where the family lives, what house are, is the family going to buy, what cars are appropriate, children, children expenses and education, where are the family vacations. So this idea of considerable economic power, as we think about it, it's not just the wealth management industry and Liz, Liz and Kane thinking about women and wealth, it's everybody. Major brands are thinking about this because the idea of the, of the purchasing power of women has really caught their attention. So when we talk about this and the considerable economic power of women, today I think it really determines whether companies are going to survive or thrive. So in turning this question, is serving women different? This is one of the things that truly guided our women in wealth community at Dimensional. It's one of the questions as we, we started to think about women in investing and women in men. You know, is serving women different? Is it different than men? It was really the central question that we were trying to understand all those years ago. And even before all those years ago, when I would get a call saying, Kane, can you come speak to a, a female audience about investing? Because I can tell you just from my own personal experience as an engineer, I had so many questions about money that I didn't I didn't know where to go to when I before I got my MBA, before I, I got my CFA. Uh, and I think a lot of women feel the same way. So what I'd like what I am about to share with you are what I think are some really interesting takeaways about how serving women different. But the first thing I want to do is I want to dispel dispel what I think has become a common myth that women are a niche. And I think by just purely looking at the definition of niche and what it what it means, you know, the things that stand out to me when I read this definition on the screen is that it's a small specialized sec uh, section of the population. So before we go any further, I want to spotlight what I think is an important point. Women are not a niche. And I may be making some generalizations, but I'm probably going to come back to this thought a few times. And I want you all just to think about it. Like when people talk about women and selling to women, women are 51% of the population. Saying women are a niche is like saying men are a niche. And Dimensional works with a lot of wealth advisors. If one of them came to me and said, I work with men, well, you can see how silly that statement sounds, but there's a lot that say that, you know, a lot will say, well, I work with women. But one point I want to make, and this was kind of an aha for us early on, is that women are a diverse group. As such, women can have very different financial needs, financial goals. They can have different risk tolerances. But that said, there are some common hurdles that we started to look at and to recognize. So what you see on this slide actually took us a long time to put together. It's, it's actually a simple slide and it's divided into what we look at as the accumulation phase and the spending phase. Accumulating all the wealth that you're gonna do and spending, you know, hopefully when you're in retirement. So even though we recognize that women are not a niche, we continue to ask that probing question, like where are the differences between men and women? What were some of the common hurdles that women face? And I think of the things on this slide as some of the tangible differences. And I think when you lay it out like this, it's pretty digestible. So if we look at the right side first and we look at the spending phase, longevity. You know, we kind of got to it that first poll question about asking about widows. Women on average are still expected to live about five years longer than men. The census puts those numbers and we'll see what happens with the next census, but currently it's 82 for women and 77 for men. Now, one interesting stat that is out there 
that, uh, again, allude to our polling question is there's a stat that's out there that says that 80% of men die married and 80% of women die single. So it kind of speaks to that, that, that idea of the widow question that we started with. And widows, I think, are, are, are definitely a segment that a lot of advisors have really specialized in. But the last U.S. Census, they actually showed that 80% of centurions, so those are folks who are over 100 years old, are women. Another census data, nearly 700,000 women every year lose their husband. And those who are widowed outlive their husband on an average by 14 years. Now, some of that is because I think still generally speaking, not all women, but women tend to marry men a little older. And combined with the fact of longevity, that's where you get an average of, of 14 years. And we're dealing in averages. So there's going to be specific differences along the way. Also in the spending phase is this idea of higher health care costs. We talk about how women outlive their spouses. Women, by and large, are also doing a lot of caregiving uh, to both aging parents and a lot of times their aging spouse. So when t time comes for them to need caretaking, a lot of times that's not as readily available uh, as it is for men in, in similar situations. So women and, and the longevity piece of this also contributes to higher lifetime health care costs, as well as things like the types of illnesses that women may need care for in their later years contributing to it. So it's kind of a, a combination of those two things. Um, on the accumulation side, lower lifetime earnings. Common things that influence this are time out of the workforce. Women still take more time for children and aging parents. Women are also uh, affected by gender pay gap. That's also one of the things that can contribute uh, broadly. What the gender pay gap is right now is it's a gap of about 20 to 20%, where typically uh, if a man is paid a dollar, the average across the board is 82, per, 82 cents per dollar. And that's that's a 2018 number. So it's in 2017, it was 80. So we see that these are changing. And this is a good time to point out that it's not all women. Uh, and there's different studies. Sometimes people argue with me on the gender pay gap. And we pointed out here, not as a, a point to drive any division, but just to point out of the things that, again, affect big areas of our life with accumulation and spending. Divorce also, another point that sometimes people think of as controversial, but women tend, uh, and there's a number of articles and studies out there that show that women are more financially affected in the long term by divorce. Now, if you're a man that's divorced, it doesn't mean that you aren't affected, but what the studies show, and a lot of it has to do with significantly reduced income later in life uh, of the, the woman uh, in this uh, with respect to divorce. So those are some of the things that, again, we see as different. And finally, the last part, the the we're on this slide where it says impact ability to grow their wealth. We have listed risk aversion. There's uh there's a number of studies out there that look at women and kind of make a blanket statement that women are more risk averse. And there's some evidence to speak to that. We have also seen that women tend to have more money in cash, and and that. There's some articles and uh, other studies out there that point to women learn to save earlier in life than men do and that they are good savers. Uh, that can also have a detrimental effect if, you, if somebody has a lot of money in cash that's not being put into investment to build into uh, long term long-term savings, long-term retirement savings. So the attitude toward risk, again, and again, noting that not all women are the same, women have different risk preferences, but there is some evidence out there that women tend to be a little bit more conservative in their allocations and, the, and risk and reward are related. And that can have an effect on the all, all on their accumulations uh, phase. So adding this together, if you look at the slide and think about accumulation 
and also spending, a lot of times what it points to generally is that women tend to accumulate a smaller nest egg and have higher income needs in the spending phase. So I'm gonna pause there and Liz, open it up to you to see if you have any comments on this slide. And then also to see if there's any questions that may have come through. Yes, I mean, I agree 100% with everything that you um, just said. And you know, as I was preparing for this webinar, I looked at a lot of statistics myself. And one that um, stood out to me was that divorce rates double after the age of 50. And so that's a pretty staggering number. And so we get asked a lot about the issues that women face when they go through divorce. Yeah. And more often than not, I mean, these women haven't been involved in the financial decision making. So um, a UBS poll last year found that 58% of women defer their long-term financial discussions to their spouses or ex-spouses. And more than half, um, say their spouse takes the lead in handling the family's finances beyond paying the bills. So while they may pay the bills and have that economic power when it comes to things like investments, retirement, insurance, and other financial planning areas, they really are starting at ground zero. And so when you add the emotions of going through a divorce on top of all of those things, I mean, it is very overwhelming. Um, so I, as an advisor, you know, it's our job to build a support team to advocate for these women and in their best interest. Um, they often come to us with questions like, who's going to get what? Um, how do I protect myself? Where should I reallocate my assets? Um, it's our job to work through these things. And so a lot of times when, as we're going through um, the process, um, you know, we're asking questions like, should they keep the house? What part of the retirement savings and investments should they take? Should they take more or less of one type of investment over another? You know, sometimes they have a closely held business. So how, do, how are we gonna value that? What will their lifestyle be? How much can they afford? You know, is there gonna be debt that they take on? So every situation is different, but these are the common themes that I see with working with my, my clients. And so we really help them visualize what their new life um, will look like. Um, we define and prioritize their goals and put a cost in real dollars to those goals. Um, sometimes that means navigating the trade-offs of these goals in order to get to a place that's sustainable. That plan becomes you know, our initial roadmap and then we change course um, as necessary. But we really have to keep them focused on the long-term, keep, keep them grounded. Um, and I think the other thing that people don't really realize when they start off, um, when you talk about financial setbacks due to divorce, it costs more to be single, which is something that a lot of people don't, you know, really realize or think, you know, as they first embark um, on this process. So. Liz, that is that is so in line with what I hear. And I know you specialize in working with women that have gone through divorce, that are divorcing. You know, well, you talked about the emotional element of it. And, you know, what we what we heard, because we've run workshops on this for advisors to gain some understanding, we've heard that it's such a confusing time, that there's a realization of that they're now in charge. And that is can be can be and is many times overwhelming. And what you talked about as far as helping to evaluate priorities, you know, keeping the house is not always something that is is in her best interest. And an advisor really help evaluate those priorities and also be strategic uh, for the current situation and then even thinking down the line, helping to run scenarios of what life could look like. You know, sometimes the wife is actually the more affluent one in divorce too. Again, women aren't all a niche. Sometimes the wife can be a breadwinner. And so an advisor can help her think about how to manage those marital assets, uh, which she might feel more entitled to. Uh, so it's an endlessly interesting discussion, but I'm so glad you pointed that out on, on this slide, because I think it's one of the things that a lot of people don't think about. And by the way, if you're, look, if you're at this webinar today and you're thinking, I need to be more involved, that's that's the whole point of this is to get you thinking about it and get you thinking about the things that really matter. So I want to share a few other things that also we've been looking at that 
I think this is endlessly fascinating. And it's this idea of the confidence gap. Uh, we, again, in trying to think of this question about how women are different than men, there's a well-documented confidence gap. And what do we mean by that? And it's not that women aren't smart. We just saw how many women were getting degrees. But it's this idea that women generally underestimate their abilities when it comes to things like tests or applying for jobs unless they meet all the qualifications or they don't consider themselves as knowledgeable about financial matters. So Dimensional, we work with, again, a lot of advisors. We ran an investor study, and this is one of the questions that we were able to put on our investor study. And the investor study worked with investors, not advisors. Um, but we were able to put this question on to, and asked about how do you rate, how confident are you, how confident are you about your investment knowledge? And you can see the you can see the responses. There were thousands of participants that answered this question, and what we saw was that about sixty percent of men describe themselves as confident versus about forty percent of women. Now, interestingly, only eleven percent of men describe themselves as not confident, where it was double for women. So again, women are a niche. There are some very confident women out there, but it gets into this idea of confidence and where we have it and where we might be struggling. One of my favorite books, and actually I brought it along with me, is a book called The Confidence Code. This book is, it, it's one of my favorite books on confidence and it's a lot to get through, but it dives into a ton of research, both biological and social, that speak to how women are different. And that's again, that big question that we were trying to understand. And it, it talks about some of the ways that women struggle with confidence. Now, it's not all bad. Uh, if you look at some of the behavioral studies, one of the things that, that the behavioral studies will talk about is that men tend to be overconfident. And back to that question about differences between men and women, the behavioral studies will describe men as overconfident when it comes to investing. And historically what that means is that it translates into speculation, trying to figure out what the market's gonna do or a specific stock and also trading more. While women are more goal oriented and, that, and they tend to trade less. And again, those are behavioral studies that look at that that have, have shown that. So in these studies, overconfidence isn't framed as necessarily a good thing. It can actually hurt from an investing perspective. Trading less is actually good because trading for trading's sake usually increases your costs, but not your returns. And some, and some studies show that women tend to be better diversified, more patient and focused on the long term. And these strengths are also some of the strengths that I think are spotlighted in the, the confidence code. So some of the uh, some of the things in that book also talk about a tendency toward perfection, perfectionism, which, again, isn't necessarily a good thing. But I think that for women, it's looking at all aspects of their lives. It's thinking about goals. And those things are really, really matter and really contribute to a good investing experience. Another thing that we looked at were about things that I would describe as sometimes I call the things listed here on this slide as some of the intangibles. And it it speaks to priorities. So, you know, a couple slides back when we looked at the things like longevity and accumulation and spending phase, I think of those as tangible because you can kind of measure them. And you can measure the differences. You can measure somebody's lifespan. You can measure healthcare costs. You can look at the effects of divorce. These elements on this slide are just as important, but they're harder to measure. And what we have learned from talking to, again, hundreds of advisors is that it's things that are important to women are incorporating personal values. And that could be philanthropic. It could be related to family. It could be related to personal goals. And a couple of examples might help. Um, what advisors have shared with us over the years is that children can be a huge factor in assessing priorities. Uh, I think all of us have heard that stereotype image of, you know, a mom putting her children first in all aspects of their lives. But it's not just small children. There was an advisor, and actually this conversation has echoed with multiple advisors, but the one who first mentioned it 
was about five years ago. There's an advisor that I work with in Southern California that specializes in women in transition. And she said to me, she said, Kane, one of the biggest threats to my clients financial future was paying for adult children who failed to launch. So said another way is helping adult children be independent are actually one of the things that can help women be more be successful in their financial life. And we're not saying that children aren't important. And for the fathers out there, we're not saying that children aren't important to men, but we're just noting that in our experience that many women have are, are like many women are, are prone to sacrificing some of their own financial well-being for their children. So I think in things like in discussions like this, it's good to just put it out there and empower people to think about that and think about smart ways to make all the priorities in their life work. You know, philanthropy is another example of uh of women, dif some differences between men and women. Wall Street Journal did an article a couple years back that actually looked at giving between men and women that were in similar situations. And what they found was that women tended to give more at all income levels. And they were twice as likely to say that giving to a charity was one of the more satisfying aspects of having wealth and that it was important to make a positive impact on society and to the issues that were important to them. Managing transitions. So managing transitions, we've kind of hit on it already. Uh, some of the biggest transitions that women face are death of a spouse, divorce, but also things like career change, retirement, and also something broadly identified with for many women and some men is being part of a sandwich generation. And it's this idea that women are caught between two generations, their children and their aging parents. And so many studies have talked about women uh, stepping up with care, caregiving duties. And specifically with this idea of the sandwich generation, it's the idea that women have are, uh, are, 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 are kind of caught in that they have to share, they have to support their, their own time and energy constraints with the many inputs that are begging for those those support, energy, and time uh, demands from them. And then lastly, one of the things, again, intangible, but you're thinking about it, is that one of the things that we hear is from a lot of advisors is they'll say that their, their female clients, at the end of the day, they just want, they want to know they're going to be okay. They may have other things that are more interesting to them than you know, pouring over the, the financials of their own situation. And Dimensional in our own investor survey found that this idea, the sense of security, it's important for both men and women investors. And it is actually ranked as the biggest value that advisors provide, both for men and women. But for women, it's even higher. So these are some of the, again, priorities that if we were to think about broadly that we've seen come up, and I think it's like for everybody watching today, it's it's important to think about your own priorities to make sure that they're covered and to think and to have be able to have discussions in new ways. Liz, I'm going to hand it back to you. Is there anything that you would add on this as far as working with female clients? No, I think first, I mean, I know we keep highlighting divorce and death and um, those are two big transitions that uh, a lot of women face but you know some women myself included choose to be single right so we have the same yeah. challenges um we might be in a if you're in a same sex relationship or something like that the, the um the planning still needs to be done it just changes you know the conversation a little bit so i don't want to just harbor on on death and divorce because i think it's important for for all women and some of the the women, especially some of the people on this call, I know are the breadwinners of their family as well. So it's hard to fit all of that into a presentation like this. Um, but I, I will say that we do get a lot of questions um, about widows and what do they need to think about? Because as you've already touched on, you know, women do live longer and widows outnumber widowers four to one. Um, so nearly, you know, two and three women go into retirement um, and they will outlive their husbands. So, you know, if you go back to that UBS poll that we talked about earlier, 
these widows haven't been involved with the decision making. Um, and so they really need help reassessing what life and retirement will look like going forward. Um, just as in any transition, just really um, as questions are, are the same in, in a lot of the different areas. Um, you know, will they have enough to do the things they want to do? And what happens if they do fall sick or they need long term care themselves? You know, who's there to take care of them and what roles do they want their children or other relatives to play? If any, some don't want to even put that burden on their children. Um, and then, you know, especially as you're if you're talking about um, being a widow, there are a lot of technical things that have to happen, right? So if you haven't been involved with the financial decision making, now all of a sudden you, you've got to go out and find all of these key documents. You know, you've got to start interfacing with attorneys and CPAs um, and really have a good professional team in place. Um, and so I think I think it can be a, a challenging, a challenging time. Um, but the things that we try to help with during that transition, you know, once we know what we have is making sure that they are getting all the benefits that they are entitled to, um, updating and retitling of assets such as homes and bank and brokerage accounts, um, you know, paying off any debts or refinancing, uh, making sure we have the right insurance coverages in place, uh, making sure especially that our healthcare coverage is there, um, and then updating uh, legal documents, um, not only to protect them, but also to protect their heirs. Um, so there's a lot to, f to figure out. And you know, in today's landscape too, if you add in uh, digital assets, like what do you do with the Facebook account or the Apple Music collection, mm -hmm. you know, all those electronic files, I mean, the list is long and it's really hard to sort through. So I think it's important, no matter what the transition is, that you are working with somebody that's going to help you navigate that course. You know, you remind as you were talking, you reminded me of something else that a lot of times we'll talk about, and it could be tangible, it could be intangible. Is just this whole time factor. You mentioned professional women, and that's another thing that we also have looked at. There is advisors, and, and I know you also work with professional women as well. Um, they just don't have the time to really do deep dives into their own financial situation. I know when I was an engineer, I didn't have a lot of time. I, first off, I didn't have the same interest that I have in it today. And I think, but I was you know, a professional woman doing really cool stuff. I worked at Disney, as, as Liz mentioned, so I was like running around the world installing theme park attractions. And I remember a conversation uh, between colleagues where they were talking about stocks and I didn't know I didn't have anything to contribute to the conversation. And it, you know, it was probably some nonsense about like what the market did today. And like years later, I know that they didn't know anything either about stocks, but it just showed me that that women a lot of times we're busy with other things in our lives. And the subject of transition also speaks to even career. I and if you were to compare men and women, I just think generally speaking that there are more transitions that women face through the course of their lives. And that is, it, not that men don't have transitions as well, but the time factor is another one of these insidious things that almost work against us in, in making sure that we're watching our, our whole house when it comes to financial decisions, even if we are interested in that. So with that, I actually, you know, one of my goals uh, in this whole thing is really to encourage the conversation. And I think that we, we, I think women, kind of alluding to my discussion about not contributing to that conversation when I was an engineer, I, 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 one of the questions we wanted to understand was to understand how often women might be talking about investing. And so this was another question that we had on our end investor study that we wanted to see if there was differences between men and women is just like how often they bring up investing conversations. And what we saw in this, in our numbers is that about 50% of men answered that at least monthly, they're talking about investments with family, friends, colleagues, where women, it was about a third. Now you do see that number is not zero. So just like everything else, there is a spectrum. Uh, of, of people and there could be many reasons why people do or don't talk about investing but this is one of the things that I, I, I think anecdotally 
that like when I talk to a lot of my girlfriends, we don't always talk about money. And there have been certain things that we've been doing at Dimensional to really promote conversations and thoughts around money to make it more meaningful. Um, and Fidelity, it's not just Dimensional that is looking at this. Fidelity had done a study a few years back and they actually, this particular study was to look at how women view and address their finances and things that are holding them back and things that are uh, encouraging them to change. And what they had found was that 90, 92% of women wanted to learn more about financial planning. 75% wanted to learn about money and investing. 83% wanted to get more involved in their finances within the next year. But they also found that the majority of women held back when they were talking about money. And so for us, I think my goal, like my personal goal is I want women to have a better investing experience. And so part of all of this is really to, to help people think about it, encourage the conversations. And as we wrap up, I want to end up with end with a few key investment principles. So as we think about women and wealth with the emphasis on wealth, <laughs> I, uh, Versant sent out also with this webinar um, a handout called Pursuing a Better Investment Experience. And it features 10 things you can do to have a better investment experience. I also think that it is a fantastic piece to help encourage the conversation. And the thing is, is like what I've learned in my career in investments, and it's taken me years to learn this, is you don't need to know everything about the market to have a good investment experience. And the basics go a long way. This handout, Pursuing a Better Investment Experience, 10 things, it is the basics. And so I encourage all of you to read it. I'm not gonna go through all 10, but I wanted to spotlight a few things that really stood out to me when I think about investing and leave on a positive, note on investing and by the way this is not a commercial for dimensional these are these are good key investment principles to apply whether you're using us or or somebody else uh, but i want to leave you with that so the first idea is that this idea that capital markets have rewarded long-term investors you see on the slide various asset classes and how they performed Take stock that there is over 80 years of financial science that help explain returns. And you can use that information, you can leverage the science to build a better investment portfolio. So historically, equity and bond markets have provided growth of wealth that is that more than offsets inflation. And the asset classes that you see on this slide, you can assemble to help achieve your long-term goals. Other things that matter, and this might surprise people, but your emotions, your emotions matter more than people realize. Many people caught, get caught up in the, uh, you know, if you think about as this chart is showing uh, the stock market and how it goes up, we've certainly seen that in recent months. But people get caught up in emotions of missing out when prices are high or wanting to sell when prices are low. Uh, but markets by their nature, they are volatile. They go up, they go down. So having a plan, working with an advisor, thinking long term, asking questions, even if you don't feel like you know the answer, all of that can go into having a better investment experience. Another thing that might not be as obvious is just what I would call headlines. Tied to emotions, headlines are there to catch our attention probably even more so today. We live in a 24 seven world, whether we are looking at news and print or if we're looking at them on our phones or we're watching a news stream that's flashing headlines. Headlines are there in the various forms to catch our attention and to capitalize on our emotions. The thing I would ask everybody to remember is that the, he the goal of the headlines is not the same goal as your goal. And their goal is to draw you in, to click on that headline, to reach more viewers. So separating your goal from theirs is an important step in deciding what matters. And then lastly, this idea of controlling what you can control. 
And a focus on what you can control could be about creating an investment plan that's really all about you, about your needs, about your goals, and about what risk tolerance you're comfortable with. The things that matter in investment are things like diversification, reducing expenses, staying disciplined. This isn't as interesting, like you look at a slide like this, it's not always as interesting as what's going on in the headlines. But my goal, again, in all this is, in addition to encouraging the conversation, is to spotlight the things that matter. I wish I had known when I was an engineer how to uncomplicate investments. The simple things, the basics go a long way. And my other goal in all this is really to empower you to think about your own situation. And I hope that some of the things that we covered speak to you and speak to you as thinking about, hmm, that's interesting. What does it mean for me? Because at the end of the day, we all, what I would like is for everybody, every woman out there to have a great investment experience that capitalize, uh, capitalizes on what's important to you. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Liz. Thank you, Kane. I think it was a, a great conversation today and touching obviously high level because we could go on and on for hours and hours about this subject. I think we're both very passionate about it. <laughs> um, I, I do want to make sure that everybody on this call knows that we are going to do a deeper dive um, this fall um, on financial empowerment. Um, it's going to hopefully be in person. We don't know given COVID and all the things that it's throwing our way, but it is scheduled um, for November. Um, and so uh, we hope that you will all join us um, for that event and more details um, will be coming out. I also just wanted to go back to the brochure that Kane um, referenced earlier. It is available for you to download. So if you um, hover over the little uh, icon that says files, you should be able to see a PDF of the brochure where you can download it. So we, we hope that you will do that. It's an excellent tool. And I think we can open it um, up for questions. Now we have a few that have come into the, to the queue. Um, and one of them, and Kane, you probably have heard this question um, through other advisors that you work with, but you know, with women and trying to prioritize, you know, children and their own lives. Um, if I want to save money for my child's education while still while still saving for my own retirement, how should I prioritize these? And so, um, from a planning perspective, um, you know, I think you you have to take care of yourself first. Um, and for all the reasons that we just went through, um, especially if you find yourself, um, you know, outliving your husband and your resources, all of those, you need to make sure you have those resources um, available to you should you need them. Um, and so the college education is secondary. It can be, um, we can always borrow for it if we need to, but make sure that you are planning for your retirement first and foremost. Would you like to add anything, Kane? I agree with you 100%. And that is, again, a lot of times we're talking to hundreds of advisors. Uh, some of the things that we've also heard is that when kids have more skin in the game, and there's, there's, there's a lot of advisors that will do educational events around children and money, that when children actually have skin in the game, the college degree means more, and they work harder for it. Uh, and, and I think like that mental shift, and I think women can think about their own situations and think of the times when they've had skin in the game and things have just meant so much more to them. It's, 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 it's a shift in the way of engaging. And I would say that advisors have also told us that by having children do that, it's actually, it's actually about love. It's about loving your children and helping to set them up for success. The other flip side that we've heard is that it also speaks to uh, women taking care of themselves so that their children, that they're, you know, women worry about being a burden to their, their children later in life. And by prioritizing that, you're setting a good example for yourself and also uh, setting the, you know, thinking about your children in the future as well. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to help them. I mean, that's the thing. It, this is not an all or nothing thing, but right. it's, it's helping to figure out the right balance 
of what makes sense for where you are, where your child is, and, and, and also giving them some good financial basis as well. That's right. And, you know, you mentioned self-care, which um, is going to be a bigger component of the um, women's empowerment thing that we're doing this fall. And Kane, you and I will be back together again and with several other women on that panel. But I think self-care is going to be a, a big piece of that because I think oftentimes, you know, women are pulled in so many different directions and they forget um, that they need to take care of themselves um, also. So, you know, Liz, especially like with the thing we talked about with the sandwich generation, uh, there's actually there's actually a white paper that people wrote about the sandwich generation. And I when I've talked about that in the past and again, if we were in the live audience, I'd ask, like, how many of you have heard of the sandwich generation? And you see hands just shoot up. And it's one of those things that people don't identify. And I know I I mean, I went through this in my own situation. My mom passed away a couple of years ago and what we learned from that experience was that it was all about helping each other and figuring out how to self-care like we even self-care because if you don't have the energy yourself then you don't have anything to give to anybody else but i think again i think it's worth highlighting in this because women almost need permission to know that this is a legitimate thing this isn't just some airy airy thing that we're throwing out there like you need to self-care it's it's one of the things that we see uh, again talking from hundreds of advisors and people thinking about these things that women aren't necessarily taking enough care for themselves and then they've got these other other life issues that they're dealing with and it's hard it's it, there's not it's not like there's some easy answer that you're going to get it right all the time and I think actually an advisor can help navigate those things as well. That's right. But if we're not taking care of ourselves, it's hard to take care of other people the way that that we want to. Uh, so, all right. I think we have time for one last question. We have some questions um, around Social Security benefits, um, both um, if you are divorced or if your husband passes away. So one is if I am divorced, can I still collect on my spouse's Social Security benefit? And the answer is depends. <laughs> Um, but if you were married 10 or more years to that spouse and you did not remarry and your spouse's or ex-spouse's in this case uh, benefit is larger than your own record, then yes, you would be able to collect. Whoever's record is higher, um, if your husband were to pass away um, before you and he had a higher benefit than yours, then yes, you would step up into his benefit. Uh, the only downfall is, um, you know, you were collecting both benefits um, for a while, and now you are going down to one, but it would be the higher of the two. So, some great questions. I know we have some others um, that we will be reaching out to you individually since we are, are out of time here today. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we hope to see you all in some fashion uh, this November. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.